grab your Bibles this morning and turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And um, just by show of hands, how many of you were, were here last week? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll have to recap a little bit. Here's the reason why. Um, last week, in each of the messages, uh, I ended at different spots, <laughs> which I don't normally do that. I usually end at least at the same point or whatever, but last week was, uh, was different. Why was it different? Because I personally felt so strong the Lord's presence in the message. I could feel him, if that makes any sense. And the magnitude of what Paul is teaching the church at Corinth, it's eternal truth, and it applies to us. And last week, God had his way with us as a church regarding this topic that comes out of the expositional teaching. Expositional meaning we go verse by verse through the Bible, but the topic, as we looked at last time, was salvation's key. Remember that? And it's still the topic today as we look at part two of this message. Salvation's key. And last week we saw just about or at 100 people by the end of the services except Christ. Why? Because as I heard from some of them, they had been experiencing sorrow and they had been sorry to others and to God all their life, but they had never heard that they could experience repentance and be changed. And they received that with gladness. They were happy about that. And that's exactly the point of Paul's message to the church at Corinth. He rebukes them and exhorts them in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians is a response to that letter. And as humans go, maybe some pushed him away. I don't know. Maybe some pushed last Sunday's message away. I don't know. But some responded exactly as Paul had intended and exactly last Sunday as God had intended. And that is great news. And so we continue on together. Look in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. Now I rejoice, says Paul, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces or leads to, generates salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. He lists now those seven things, and we'll dive into these in detail today. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. That's number two. Number three, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication... In all these things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong. He's speaking about a particular person. Nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. So salvation's key. This is where we went to last week together. Verses 9 and 10, we learned that there's a reality of sin, and we're fooling ourselves to think that there is no sin. Sin is, as we looked at, the missing of that perfect target. And we, we elaborated on the fact that every one of us as humans have missed that perfect target, which is God's holy standard. It's not a human standard. It's not, a, it's not even a rule of uh, coloring within the lines or being such and such a person or keeping the golden rule or if I just do the, if I pay my taxes and if I'm nice to everybody and, and, and walk grandma across the street, then I'll be accepted. It had no bearing or no uh, relationship to human effort, human good doing, though we all appreciate good doing. It had to do with the fact that every human is in need of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we we argued the fact that somebody may counter that and say, man, that is narrow-minded. That is the most bigoted thing for you to say, that everybody needs salvation through Jesus Christ. I understand how you might feel about that, but the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him. And we talked about how if I withheld that information from you, I would do you a great disservice and, in fact, pat you on the back as you would slip into hell. Jesus came to keep you out of hell, to keep me out of hell. 
And as I mentioned last week, at about this moment in the message, I'm saying it again, you might be thinking, he's mentioned sin. He's mentioned repentance. And it's getting worse every week. Now he's mentioned hell. (laughs) All of these things God came in human flesh to spare you and I from. It is the glorious gospel news. And we saw this, that sin in verse 9, repented of, leads to joy. It leads to joy. He says, I'm not rejoicing because you were made sorry. No, 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 no. I rejoice because your sorrow led to repentance. You looked at God's standard. You saw that you had fallen short and you cried out to God and God brought you absolute restoration. He brought you repentance of heart to truly be repentful of heart. And it's a godly sorrow, completely different than the sorrow of this world, which we saw in verses 9 and 10, is that sin defeated leads to life. He said there that so that you might suffer loss from us in nothing, for godly sorrow, number one, produces, number two, repentance, number three, that leads to salvation, that there's no other way for a man or a woman, a boy or girl to be saved than to own up to the fact that I have sinned and I need God. And all of a sudden, that brings an atmosphere for all of us. Christian, listen, you and I can only live the Christian life by the power of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we shall see today. And that means you and I, though we're grieved over sin, and though we're grieved over the sin in our lives and the sin of other people's lives, we do not condemn them. We do not judge them. We reach out to them with the glorious news. By the way, you know what? I love this time of the year. For many reasons, one of them, this week, we're coming up on, listen, don't let anybody fool you, this coming week, we are coming up on an exclusively Christian religious holy day. Do you know what it's called? It's called Thanksgiving. Did you know that? It is exclusively Christian. It's founded upon the word of God. It was dedicated by godly people. It is the celebration of God's power to deliver in the context of the pilgrims in their suffrage uh, in the founding of this nation. Yes, but it's more than that. Because the very motive of the pilgrims having come was, as you can read about it this week, by the way, I, you should read it at Thanksgiving Day. You should stand up in your fam- at your family's gathering. Do you want to create a riot in your family? Oh, come on, create a storm. Do it. Go and print out the Mayf- Mayflower Compact. And say, hey, everybody, put down your beer. Stop your cussing for a second. See, I have family just like you do. (laughs) And say, I want to read something to you. And read it out loud. Thanksgiving. Another one is, of course, Christmas. The coming of Christ. Why? Because we need salvation. And Jesus came for us. Why? To give us life. The third thing we saw last time, it's where we left off, is sin ignored leads to death. He says, the godly repentance that you exhibited is not to be regretted of, but sorrow, the sorrow of the world produces death. The world today is sorry, not because it has sinned against God. The world today is sorry because it got caught. All of us know what that's like. By the way, I... Now, let me tell you, I didn't get a ticket yesterday. I thought about getting the ticket yesterday. (laughs) Why? I was driving in a strange town. I I had to go to LAX very early in the morning to take someone to the airport. And then Lisa and I went over again very early in the morning to uh, Manhattan Beach and had breakfast there, right on on the drive. Beautiful. But I was unfamiliar with the area, and I didn't know what the speed limit was. Isn't it interesting? The moment I saw an oncoming police car. Now, listen... and. I was actually innocent because I didn't know the law. Are you with me? And I looked down, and I looked, and I was going 35, but I didn't know if it was the speed limit 25 or is it 45. I didn't know. The specter, the atmosphere of not knowing led me to doubt. Right? Then it led me to look and look and look and look. I never saw the speed limit. He didn't turn around and come after me. Interestingly enough, when I did see the speed limit, I was right there at the speed limit. The law was posted. I didn't know about it. I was concerned about that. You may not know God, but you may be concerned about eternity right now. That's a God thing. You may not know the speed limit, but you know that there's a good chance that you've gone over it. And if you didn't go over it yesterday morning in Manhattan Beach, you could have gone over it or you know you've gone over it at some point in time. And then the law is posted and you do a check, right? You check and see. 
You examine your life. And you come to the conclusion, oh, have I sinned? Now, have you sinned against God in a sense? Listen, have you sinned against God by going over the speed limit? Well, yes and no. But ultimately, really, the issue is God's not going to give you a ticket for going over the speed limit. But who will? The police officer. Why? He represents the city. You sin against the city. And they want you to make restitution for that. And they don't want you... They, do you think it matters to the city fathers of, of uh, that town, to, of Manhattan Beach, to say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, officer. Well, he may say, well, that's fine. I'm, I'm, so, I'm glad you're sorry. But uh, make sure you write the check out to the city of Manhattan Beach. <laughs> you hear me? Godly sorrow says, where do I make out the check? Are you with me? Remember, we talked about this. Just say you're sorry. God never accepts that. Nor should you and I from people. And nor should you think you get off the hook by telling somebody you're sorry. That's godly sorrow. Sorry. Sorry I got caught. Sorry I got in trouble. Sorry I tipped up the cart. Tipped over the show. Sorry. No, no, no. The godly sorrow is, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And I lay myself out, remember the meaning of the word, I lay myself out before you. True godly sorrow comes with no requirements, no preconditions. And you come to Christ and you say, God, I've sinned and against you only have I sinned. Yes, others have been affected. If we don't do that, it leads to death, says the Bible. Here we go. Point number two. We dive into it now. Number two, salvation's key is this, is the awareness of holiness of true holiness. And the first thing we see here is holiness alters our habits. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. We talked about or we started heading towards this key, key understanding. When it says here that you sorrowed in a godly manner, it means that you became emotionally and soulfully distressed to be under the weight of great sadness, not because, again, of being caught, but because you see now, I've sinned against God. It is so profound. It's a heavy weight. It's a state of grief, a heaviness of the soul, a deep sorrowfulness, and it has nothing to do with being caught. It has to do with the realization of, listen, everybody, God is holy. God is holy, and I am not holy. It's kind of like crying out in the sense of, Becoming aware of God and, and your distance from him. And you cry out like Job. And he says, will I see God ever in the flesh? Will I ever experience God? Have I sinned so far that he will not accept me? Have I sinned so far that I cannot be forgiven? And God rushes right back to your heart and says, a broken heart and a contrite spirit I will not reject. Isn't that good news? Someone say amen with me. Amen. Amen. I am so grateful for that. But as a church, we want to always be careful. We talked about the difference in point one between true biblical Christianity and that Romanism way of thinking. If I just say I'm sorry and do my penance or whatever, then I'm okay with God versus a true, deep sorrow that I've sinned against God. We need to be very careful, church, that our, our sorrow that we discern and dissect it. Because you know that through our emotions, as a religious person, we can cry enough, we can do some religious actions enough to where we become our own priesthood and our own priest. If I don't go to Jesus recognizing that I've sinned against Christ, sinned against God, I can substitute the personal relationship can I say with Charles Spurgeon, the personal intercourse with God, and I'm not with him face to face, and I begin to say, okay, I've wept enough. I think I've wept enough over this issue. And I'm going to get up, and I'm going to put on a happy face, and I'm going to be good about it. Uh, I've cried enough, and, and I feel good. That's not repentance. Unless there's profound change, and one of the great manifestations is change of habits, not by human effort. That's God the Holy Spirit at work. Listen to this. Mark this down. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 15. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. 
lest any root of bitterness spring up. Notice, it's a small little root of bitterness springs up. Listen, don't respond. Are you fighting bitterness or resentment towards another human being? God says, watch out. It could destroy you. It could spring up and cause trouble. And if it does, by this, many become defiled. It doesn't just happen to you. It goes beyond you. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator, this is interesting, or profane, mentioned last time in one of the studies that it means to cross the threshold or to go too far, a person like Esau, look at this, did you know that Esau, I didn't know this, did you know Esau was a fornicator, among other things, we didn't know that in the Old Testament, but here the New Testament says, among other things, Esau was a fornicator, verse 17 goes on to say, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, Remember Jacob and Esau and his big shenanigans? He was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with what, church? Tears. Tears. Wow. Have you seen this commercial? Now, I pay attention to stuff now, because I can relate to commercials now. I get more out of the commercials than I do the TV program. (laughs) Why? Because... uh, this thing about uh, if you're having headaches and sleeplessness and lack of motivation and all these things, you may be suffering from low T. <laughs> Have you heard that? No, all the women go, I haven't heard that. And all the men goes, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Why? Um, and you look, you look at all the descriptions. Are you bummed? Are you under a cloud? Do you feel not motivated? Uh, has all your desire gone away? You may be suffering from low T. See your doctor today. And while I was putting my notes together for this message, I took a break and whatever, turned on the TV, and there was that commercial. I thought, because of, in light of this point, I'm thinking, you know what? Many people today suffer from low H, <laughs> low holiness understanding of God's word. <laughs> Are you sluggish, worn out, uninspired? Have you lost the zest for life? And they shows the cartoon of the guy. It's his shadow. He's walking along, but his shadow's like this all depressed and bummed, and then he takes his low T medicine, and he's clicking his heels, and he's all happy, and you know what? As a habit that is walking with God, and the reality of God, and living your life, and the true joy of what Christianity should be like, that is to have a high H understanding, meaning God is holy, and he didn't say, listen, he didn't say, stay away from me, I'm holy, Oh, no, no. He said, I want you near me, but your sinfulness, I'm holiness, and through Jesus Christ, my offering, you can join me. That's why the Bible announces, be holy for I am holy. How do you hear that? Is God saying to you, be holy because I'm holy. Don't bug me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says because he is holy and we're invited to be in his family through Jesus Christ, who is holy, God declares us holy. We'll end this message today with the sanctification of all that stuff. And God says, be ye holy for I am holy. Do you hear that? Be ye holy for I am holy. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, you want to have new habits in life? You want to have a new step? You want to go from this to this? (laughs) Understand that you are holy because my son made you holy. You don't have to stay in that same place that you've been bound to all your life. Jesus sets you free. Secondly, under this point, holiness causes change. Change you can believe in. I thought I'd throw that in. It's a good line, actually. The only change you can believe in is what God gives you. He says, number one, mark it. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. He lists seven profound things. Now mark this down in your margins or in your notes. Isaiah 55 verse 7 says, Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that they may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. Ladies and gentlemen, you see that verse? Next time somebody tells you there's a difference between the God of the Old and New Testament, will you remember that verse? That's the invitation of the gospel right here. Isn't that good news? Are you guys awake? Okay, that's good news. Isaiah 55, 7. God says, listen, wicked, change, come with me, be with me. What is that wicked? So I'm not wicked. Well, we're not holy. 
until God declares us holy in Christ. But doesn't God love me? Oh, yes, God loves you. Well, which is it then? It's both. The Bible says God loves us, and the Bible also says he's, wicked, he's angry with the wicked every day. Did you know that? Well, then who will fill in this void? I've been trying to tell you. It's Jesus. It's this gospel. Holiness causes a change. God changes your life. Okay, take out your notes. Let's go. Let's run through this. Pay close attention. Number one, what diligence? The word means make speed. The Corinthians made speed to change the situation. Make haste. It means to dispatch with eagerness or determination. God says when you experience true godly sorrow, you're going to be wanting the change to take place in your life, and you're going to give every bit of expedience to it. Number two, what clearing of yourselves, what does that mean? That word means, and not to be confused with making an excuse, to make no excuse, to deal straight up with the offense, to make no excuse. Number three, what indignation, that word means this better, um, what grief, what pain, what disgust you endured. There was a a reaction to the pain that sin causes? Look, don't raise your hand. Don't jump up and say, amen, I know. But can we not all agree that sin, as it infiltrates our lives and causes wedges and divisions and things, that it hurts? Doesn't it hurt? And then, listen, the grief that it caused, and that, I understand, could be viewed on the human side. But listen, you're a Christian. You're walking in this world. You are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're for real. And you and I get grieved, yes, over the consequences, but most importantly, over the fact that it hurts the heart of God. And it grieves us with indignation. Number four, what fear? This speaks to the fact that there's a reasonableness of fear. There's a terror in the sense of the offense of God that God is always watching. You know, I've told you before, but uh, Christopher Hitchens, who is now in, in eternity, would always say in his lectures, uh, why would I believe in a God who's uh, so insecure and so uh, strange that he's got to watch you constantly? And this is one of the most brilliant guys of our modern era. And isn't it a sad, pathetic, ignorant thing to have said that? He's missed the very nature of God. He's making, in his view, the God of the Bible to be a big human, that he's insecure and he's got to watch everyone to see if they mess up. That's not the God of the Bible. Well, pastor, I feel like God just sometimes watches me constantly. Hello, he does. He cannot but see everything. He even sees thoughts. That ought to freak you out. He sees thoughts. I'll make it worse than that. The Bible says he sees thoughts, our thoughts, before we think them. Now, when I first read that in the Bible, I got in an argument with God. I said, if you know I'm about to think a bad thought, why don't you stop it in advance so I don't have to think it? (laughs) And he came right back to me and said, smooth one. But all of that originates out of the core of your own sinful nature, Jack, and that's why I came. You think about that for a moment. The reality of a true Christian life is, will I let that thought take over my life and then it manifests itself in actions? Or do I arrest that thought and fight it and take it to the cross and be on with my walk with God? Of course, yes. What vehement desire, number five. It's a compound word in the Greek. It means what burning heart or what longing heart or hot heart you had about doing the right thing. Some have translated the word an organic pursuit of God in your heart right now, whoever you are. Listen, I don't care if you have any spiritual religious upbringing or not right now. It doesn't matter. It's not what God's talking about. Do you right now have a heart to pursue God? Listen, how about this? If you're an atheist, unbeliever, you don't know anything, how about this today? If you had a chance, would you like to know God? Why don't you think about that? You've got 26 minutes to think about that. If you had a chance, not know me, not know the person next to you, not go to church, not, no. If you had a chance to know the creator God of the universe, would you? What zeal, number six, fervency. 
The word is here used in a way to turn one's self away from the path that you were going. The Corinthian church was going one way, very carnal, very alienated from God, yet they were Christians, they were going to heaven, but they were having a horrible go at obeying God. And when they woke up to the fact, I need, we need as a church to get right with God, there was a zeal about turning around. What about you? When you and I sin, is there a zeal to turn around? I'm just talking to the Christian right now this morning. Is there a zeal where you say, you know, this is wrong? Amen. See, if somebody has to come along and say, now look, dude, that's wrong. Oh, all right. Okay. Mm. You see, that's like, what? That's like finding out. Okay, I went over the speed limit. Better luck next time. Versus, what, what, is, what is the truth here in this neighborhood? What do I do? Are you longing after him right now? Do you have that heart? And then that leads to what vindication. This is a very cool word. It means that you accepted the justice of God. Uh, can I be a little bit uh, ornery this morning? I know it's for a service and all, but... I am just absolutely, I, I've gone through the, the whole cycle of this thing about social justice. It's an absolute joke, I've now concluded. The people who cry about social justice, when I talk to them, when I meet with them, they are some of the most unjust people I've ever seen in my life. Remarkable. What they're really saying is, I'm really into social justice on these two issues, of the way I interpret it, and I don't really care about anything else. Did you know that human justice stinks? Human justice is pathetic. It's bias. Human justice is ungodly. Our whole judicial system is based upon the word of God as a Judeo-Christian culture. So I don't believe that. That's because you've never re read the writings of the founders or John Locke. You want to have a nice read this afternoon? When you leave church, go read the two-volume set of John Locke with an E on the end of Locke. He's actually the... He's the one that our founding fathers studied to create our Declaration of Independence in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And it's talking all about justice that comes from a God who is just. He's holy. He's pure. And this word vindication means to accept the justice regarding the Arab, regarding the sin. And a Christian, listen... A Christian loves this. No one, listen, this is what the book of Hebrews talks about when it says nobody loves to be disciplined during the time. <laughs> listen, when our youngest daughter was little, she didn't understand things, but man, she had a strong will. She'd get in trouble. At the, we even have pictures of this. It's hilarious. She'd get in trouble, and she knew that she was about to be spanked for her trouble. So you know what she'd do? She'd pull down her pants and stand there like this. <laughs> and you'd go like this, boom, and she'd look at you like, is that all? Is that it? The, that justice doesn't work. How do you, you can't, that's got to be a heart thing. God says when he's at work in our lives and he speaks something to us, do we just say, I, I dare you, God. Spank me all you want. No, the Bible says for the child of God, discipline is not pleasurable for the season. But listen, oh, listen, especially some of you who may be in God's doghouse right now. And it ain't going good for you. Do you know, listen, you want to hear some good news? The Bible says God does not discipline any child that's not his. Can you go send up a storm? Nothing happens to you? No conscience convicted? No sorrow, no grief, no, no awareness that you've sinned against a holy God. Why? You're not his. You're religious at best, but you're not his. A child of God step out of line, and he brings a right jab out of a thunderbolt, dude, and will knock you out. Why? Because you're his kid. And none of his kids get away with stuff for long if you say, oh, I don't believe, I, I, I'm, I, want, I don't want my kind of justice. <laughs> no, listen, only God is just, and he's purely fair. Yes. And he says, he ends this 
portion of the argument. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The word proved here is awesome. The word here means this, that you set in a line the order or you, we would say today, you cleaned house. <laughs> It means to introduce, to step through the complete process, to exhibit, to stand near. God says, you stood near and you saw it all the way through to the end. And he says, you cleared yourselves in this matter. What a great thing. Third and final, final point to this, third and final point regarding this proving, which showed that they have done, did the right thing, they displayed the right thing. Look at verse 12. Salvation's key is the practice of sanctification. Can you write that down, church? This is where we end. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who had suffered wrong. I think you know what we're talking about. It's so early in the morning to have to bring this up. But Paul is specifically rebuking them for the first Corinthian chapter 5 event that we all went through a year or two ago, going through this first Corinthians, was the fact that the church at Corinth and its leadership was taunting and exalting the fact that they were so gracious as a church. We're so, we're so right on. You can come to our church no matter, no matter how you're living, no matter what you're doing. You don't need to change. You can just come and we accept everybody. Now that sounds cool on the surface. And in Corinth, they had a young man. Well, we don't know if he was young or not. It doesn't say. The Bible just says that a man was having sex with his stepmother, his father's wife, and you are puffed up about it rather than mourned. I mean, that sounds like something right out of Hollywood. Paul says, what's wrong with you? You guys nuts? He even said to them in 1 Corinthians 5, the world doesn't even do that stuff. And you do, it in, you do that and allow it in church and you exalt the issue that it's happening and you boast in it. They argued, look how, look how gracious and forgiving we are. You can have sex with anybody you want. It doesn't matter to us. That's how, that's how cool we are. And Paul says, you should be throwing up over this. The letter went out. They read it. The church dealt with it. Guess what happened? The man repented of it. Now, by the way, this is kind of sad. We have no word of the woman. Paul doesn't address if she repented or not. But the man did. The young man did. How cool is that? Does that, does that encourage you? I'll say it for you. Yes! Wow, that's, that's amazing. Yes, what happened? Sanctification is at work. To practice sanctification, jot it down, is to rehearse and to have rehearsed in you the work of God. God, can you say in your life God's at work and he's been at work? I hope so. The origin of the word sanctification is found in creation itself. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, And God blessed the seventh day and what? Sanctified it. That is, to, he declared it to be, because that in that he rested from all his work which God had uh, created and made. The word means to set apart or to declare it in a condition, in a certain way. Salvation's key, this practice of sanctification, jot it down, number one, sanctification is provided by Jesus. Verse 12, we learn that, it's provided by Jesus. Sanctification means this, you are being, watch me, you are being pulled out of this world, watch, and God takes the world out of you, are you watching? He takes you out of this world positionally, he reaches inside of you, I'm making this up now as a picture in your head. He pulls you out of the world, imagine, lifts you up off the ground, puts you up in space, so to speak, while you're out there going, what's going on with me? He reaches inside of you and takes the world out of you, and then puts you right back in the world. I love it! We are aliens now, here. That's why you don't feel like this is your home. You've never been to heaven, you've never seen God, and yet... Every day you think about, I, I can't wait to get home. God, let me be faithful until your day that you've set for me, but I'm going home. I talked with a woman of this church, 91 years old this week, who she, I'm telling you right now, her talk about heaven and being with Jesus, it's as almost though she had half her body there. It was such a reality, she can't wait, and... God's never failed me, she said. He'll never fail me in that moment, and it's going to be great. See, for those of us who are not so close to death, we're thinking, oh my gosh, what do I... We'll take vitamins. 
What? I'm going to exercise. Why? Be healthier. Live longer. Really? I mean, it's okay. Exercise. Don't get me wrong. But you and I, believer or non-believer, you're going to go into eternity the hour God has ordained. You ain't going to change it. Oh, yeah, well, what if I jump off a roof? That's the day that God ordained. <laughs> well, what if I'm resurrected from the dead in the doctor's office? That's the day God ordained. He ain't changing it. He knows. Here's the question. Where are you going? Smoking or non-smoking? Heaven or hell? <laughs> where are you going? You need to know that. Jesus provides sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What do you add to this? Look at that. Are you a Christian? Yes. Then get happy. Look at that. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality and that you, listen, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification. There's the word and honor. That is cool. Man, oh, and the Bible's just an old book. Do you know what this book, you know what that verse is talking about? Ladies, manage your sexual body parts. That's what he's saying. Don't mismanage them. And men, you manage your sexual body parts and don't mismanage them. Think of it. Isn't that brilliant? Does that not 2,000 year old wisdom I'm giving you right here. Is that not, should that not be preached in schools today? Hey kids, put away your stuff and zip it up and close it down and, and hide it. You're just asking for trouble. I can't believe he said that. I'm just talking about the Bible. sanctification. Jesus provides it. He owns your body. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. Yes. So therefore glorify God in your body which is his. Yes. Did you know your fingers belong to God? Yes. You know wherever you let your eyes go, the Holy Spirit's looking through your eyes too. Wherever my feet go, I'm going, the Holy Spirit's going with me. Secondly, on to this point, the salvation's key is the practice of sanctification. Sanctification is gifted by the Holy Spirit. It's gifted, it's given. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by, a lot of cool words there, huh? The Spirit, that's capital S, Holy Spirit, and belief in the truth. You know what Charles Spurgeon said about that? He says, sorrow in itself cannot produce anything except sadness of feeling. But godly sorrow produces change. Now, repentance is a change within us, both of thinking and of doing. We can tell if true sorrow is actually that by seeing if it produces repentance. So godly sorrow cannot be measured by feelings or by tears or by what it produces. What happens after the confession is what defines if the man be new, says Charles Spurgeon. Has the Holy Spirit visited your life with sanctification? Meaning, is the reality of him relocating your heart's affections real in your life? Is it real? This church is big enough for not only for you to see me walking around town, but for me to see you walking around town. And when things are going on in life, listen, remember, you might have a sticker, the, 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 the cross or praise the Lord or whatever sticker in the back of your car. Your car's not saved, or maybe it is saved. But on the inside, when you're arguing with your husband or your wife and it's coming out of the windows of your car, that can be heard at stoplights. Or if you're drunk weaving on the road and you've got a church sticker or some church sticker on the back of your car, that's not a good witness. Neither is you and I bumping into each other as you're carrying cases of beer out of the grocery store and you look like you just got electrocuted when we run into each other. I'm not God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. 
the question does arise in my heart, <laughs> is this person walking in sanctification? Uh, this is the Lord's beer. <laughs> I said, Pastor, I can't believe you're saying that. Well, time doesn't allow me to keep going. I have to <laughs> stick to the points here. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verse 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. By the way, he's a person, you know. You, can, you, you can't grieve an it or a force. The Holy Spirit, don't grieve him. Don't upset him. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Sealed. Now, this message, I hope, is going to end with a big, big push. It's very exciting. Are you guys ready? Are you excited about this? Are you ready? Listen, this is awesome. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Meaning, not just your death, not just now, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day when it's really going to matter. When you stand before God, the truth of the Holy Spirit having sealed you will be your great benefit. My great benefit. So what does this mean? I'm glad you asked. The word means this, to be embossed upon. You know an embosser? You have an, you have an embosser? You know what those are? Anybody? Put the paper in there and squeeze it, or you stamp a signet, signature onto something. Listen, the Holy Spirit, has he embossed you, marked you? The word means to mark out, to stamp by signet. To be exclusive, a private identification mark of ownership, a security, a preservation. I love that. To keep sealed. Don't you love it? The Holy Spirit says, I have sealed you. I've marked you of ownership, the believer. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel or demanding as the grave. What is your seal, God, upon me? Is when I look in this world, the grave is powerful. Death is powerful. What's more powerful than that? The seal of God upon your life. Have you been sealed by the Holy Spirit? Isaiah 49, verse 16. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Have I etched, embossed you? God says, I've embossed you on the palms of my hands. John 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, this is after the resurrection, called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. Again, after the resurrection. And the other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. And so he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He sounds like he's a 21st century person here. And after eight days, don't you love this? Imagine, those must have been eight days from hell for Thomas. I will not believe it. He's all bummed out walking around. Everyone's rejoicing. Thomas is around kicking a can, kicking a rock. Pfft. I don't believe it. Isn't that funny? Hey, aren't you one of the disciples? Yeah, what a waste of time that was. I mean, didn't you see Jesus? So what? You see him now? Hmm? Kicking a can. I will not believe. Eight days later. Eight days later. The disciples were again inside. By the way, the word means they were shut in. They're hiding out for fear. And Thomas is with them. Jesus came. The doors being shut stood in the midst of them. That means the miraculous appearance of Jesus. And he said, peace to you. <laughs> Why? Because Thomas had no peace. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here. And put it into my side. Ooh. That's creepy, huh? What did Jesus do? Because we know that when he would appear after the resurrection, he would, he would have his robe on. He had a robe on. But what did he, what did he do? Did he lift up his robe? Do you, did you untie the robe and it was like a V-neck? Think about it. What did he do? Or was it just through, the, just through the fabric? I don't think so. Not for Thomas. And not for Jesus. I wonder if he rolled up his robe up to his side and said, put your finger, look, put your finger 
in my holes of my hands and put your hand inside my body. Go ahead. Now, isn't it, church, listen, isn't this merciful? Do you ever doubt? Does God ever say to you, hey, you jerk? <laughs> what do you always doubt me for? No. I bet you Jesus is saying to some of us today, why don't you put your finger in the holes of my hands? Isn't it awesome our God is not afraid to be tested and proven? He goes on, though. Look at this. He says, put your hand into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Notice his hands. The sealing, the sanctifying. God has said, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. God is very committed to you. Do you know that? And we end with this, verse 12 at the end. Sanctification is how we live. Thank God. How many of you are Christians today? Raise your hands. That's how we breathe. This is how we live. Is Christianity your life? Is it everything? Yeah. Governs everything I think, say, and do, right? It governs everything, everywhere you go, doesn't it? When you pull out your checkbook or your credit card or cash in your heart, it's automatic. Lord, should I do this with your money? When you and I have like two more extra hours or whatever it is, or two, two more minutes or whatever it is, where we can, it's ours to decide, Lord, how would you have me to do this? Isn't it an amazing way to live? Yes. <laughs> Sanctification is how we live. He says, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, the Bible says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God. What a dear thing Paul is saying in Acts 20. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who, what? Are being sanctified. Are being sanctified. Well, wait, are we sanctified or not? Yes. Which one is it? Both. Those who are being sanctified right now in life, the decisions you and I make, the things you and I go through. Are you going through a trial? Is, is something happening in your life to cause you to pray? To cry out to God? Are you sick? Is it relational? Is it financial? What is it? All of it plays into the grand sanctification that you are going through. But why are we going through that? Because you are sanctified. You are and you shall be. You have been declared sanctified by God in heaven. The Holy Spirit has sealed you now. But this is why you walk and I walk through so much grief in this life. We are sanctified by God. But we are being sanctified in our daily living, in the character and in the witness of being a Christian. So cheer up. Good days are ahead. What does that mean? Things look tough. They are tough. They're going to get tougher. Good days are ahead. How can you say that? Because God says so. This world's perishing. My outward body's perishing. But the inward man is being renewed. There's a good day ahead. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Are you guys okay? We got a minute and a half left. That's a Christian minute and a half. <laughs> Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By that will we have been sanctified. How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What's the effect of it? Once and for all. Hebrews 10.14. Watch, there's no contradiction. This is divine. For by one offering, that's Jesus Christ, the offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Did you hear what I said, everybody? You are sanctified, but you're living right now. And you are being sanctified. Because you're saved, you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. How cool is that? Here's where we end. Matthew 7, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road difficult and only few ever find it. What is that? You are on that path, Christian. Christian. It is rough, it is tough, it is dynamic, but because you are sanctified, you are being sanctified with every step of your sweet little foot. God is at work both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Aren't you glad you belong to him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. 
Thank you, God, that you love us so much. Who are we to dictate and to announce what we and how we think? This ought to go and that ought to go. There is no victory but surrender in your kingdom. There is no joy but owning our sorrow of sin. And then, Lord, as you flood in and rush with your truth, we have not only been sanctified, we are being sanctified. And we are being sanctified because we have been sanctified. Father, for the household of faith today, may we leave this place. Oh, Lord, may hell shudder because first service is about to be let loose. Lord, may devils and demons shake at the fact that your kids are about to hit the streets. Father, we pray that you'd create within us and from us a divine holy riot, as it were. That the kingdom of God is about to emanate from us as we leave this place, having been refueled, charged up, and reconfirmed in the truth of your eternal word. Father, bless your people. And if anyone today here is not your child, oh Jesus, we pray in unison that they would not be able to sleep or rest one more night until they bow their knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen.